Welcome, everyone, to another edition of AEW Unrestricted. We are the official podcast of All Elite Wrestling. And my name is Tony Schiavone, and my longtime close personal friend partner is... Aubrey Edwards. What's up, Tony? Aubrey, how are you? I'm doing great. I uh, had a flight delayed yesterday, so, mm. you know, an eight-hour day of travel extended to a good 10-hour day of travel. No big deal. Well, you know, it's going to happen. We're going to be on the road. We're on the road now each and every week, so yeah. get ready. We, yeah, got Lan- we got Lance Archer with us. Hey, Lance. What's up? How are What's you, up, buddy? buddy? I'm good, George. How are you? I'm good, Fred. <laughs> good to talk to you. <laughs> that's, an inside, that's an inside joke he and I do. Um, well, well, now I need an explanation. You can't be like, that's an inside joke, and then just move on. I walked in the locker room one day and was uh, bullshitting with the guys like I, I try to do and trying to be funny and smart, and he said... Uh, try, try is the key word. Yes. <laughs> he said... Hey, Mike, how you doing? I went, I'm good. <laughs> so every time we see each other, we come up with a different name. Love I it. was doing it. <laughs> I did it. It was just fun to see his reaction. It was funny <laughs> just to see how quick he was going to be like, um, no. Uh, that was <laughs> good. Like, don't want to pull a one like, hey, do you know who I am? But it's kind of like, um, I don't know. And it's wrestling. So everyone uses fake names anyway. So like, who knows? Yeah, right, right. right. We, we have a new one and a different one about every time we see each other. So. Yes, we do. Love That's it. exactly right. Absolutely love it. All right. Let's, uh, <laughs> let's run through a little bit of your accolades. And when I say a little bit, that's an understatement because this list is quite long. Let's see. Oh, yeah. Well, there's too many to list. So two-time NWA World Tag Team Champion with Davey Boy Smith Jr. Three-time IWGP Tag Team Champion, also with Davey Boy Smith Jr. Uh, the IWGP United States Champion 2011 G1 Tag League with uh, Suzuki. Uh, one-time NWA Texas heavyweight champion. I have to scroll down while this is really long. Uh, three-time PCW heavyweight champion, one-time PCW television champion, one-time PCW tag team champion, uh, two-time NWA world tag team uh, champion at Total Nonstop, uh, one-time TCW heavyweight champion, WWC universal heavyweight champion, and 2013, you were number 95 on the PWI top 500. Damn. You, you forgot the uh, two-time Noah GC Ted. There we go. All right. <laughs> Damn, dude. Damn. <laughs> All right. So when one of the things I've absolutely loved about you, and you don't do it so much anymore since you turned babyface, is beating up dudes during your entrance and how absolutely unique that was and how much it sucked for our extras. <laughs> it's like, who's going to do it today? Uh, but my favorite one, my favorite one was when you threw Charlie through the glass. Uh, so I'm curious, like, did Charlie volunteer? Yes. Did you specifically ask him to get thrown through glass? Like, how does, how does the planning process of I'm going to throw this motherfucker through glass work? <laughs> I think it was just, you know, it, it was for the title match, uh, the anniversary show and, you know, trying to expand upon that entrance, you know, as far as attacking somebody, whether it be backstage or ringside or whatever the case may be. Um, I think it was kind of a joking moment. It was like, man, it'd be fun to throw somebody through glass. And Charlie's like, I'd go through glass. And I went, oh, really? You'll go through glass. So uh, it kind of, it, it, it grew from there. And um, it was a really cool moment for me uh, to be able to do, you know, obviously just being in the title match uh, on the anniversary show for All Elite Wrestling against John Moxley, um, was cool enough in itself, but then to get a cool entrance, like having uh, a plate glass window set up in front of the tunnel and being able to throw a human body through it while the uh, uh, the logo was uh, broadcast onto it. it was just a really cool moment, a lot of fun. I don't know if it was so much fun for um, for Charlie there, but it was fun for me. And actually, the whole thing didn't break. And so as I'm coming up to it, there's still glass, and you know I'm kind of tall, so it's right at my face level, and I just swatted it with my hand which actually cut my hand wide open doing it so you know the glass is uh tempered and prepared and ready to be broken but it's still glass yeah I, i've been kind of involved in a uh in a minor way with some of your antics uh we went to that old building one time did that mm-hmm. interview where you destroyed the commode you remember that and, <laughs> yeah. yes. and as you're destroying the first hit of the commode boom a piece of porcelain is coming right between my eyes, man. <laughs> so I'm going, yikes. Okay, so I, yeah. won't, uh, I won't talk to Lance Archer anymore. I'll let somebody else like Alex Marvez do this. Because Sli- Slightly dangerous when you're around me and I have to yeah. destroy things. Yeah, it really, it really, really is. 
<laughs> you you walked in with uh, Jake the Snake Roberts. That was the first time mm-hmm. we saw you on, on Dynamite, mm-hmm. and then you did those vignettes uh, at Darby Allen's place. Uh, talk mm-hmm. about those vignettes. Those were really cool. Yeah, you know, that kind of came out uh, – to break down that wall that was a cody idea and he basically called me on a friday and go hey can you be in atlanta tomorrow and i went yeah what are we doing he goes we'll just get on plane show up and we'll show you what we're doing and i got picked up and we showed up at darby's and they had the ring set up out in the the field and we had you know they called people and guys were driving two three four hours just to be part of it and extras and whatnot and the whole premise was kind of like it's a backyard training session. It's Jake the Snake Roberts, and he's got this monster, and you know he's basically showing the world what he is and who he who he is and what he can do. And it's just by this amazingly interesting crew of people from the the dwarf that was the announcer to the ring girl that had uh, curlers still in her hair, and and all the guys oh, that I were around the ring that were had makeup on and things like that. And you know the the our film crew. Um, the, the guys who do all the editing made that thing beyond amazing. Just all the slow-mo shots to the drum shots up above to just, you know, the, the slow-mo of Jake sitting in the chair with the smoke billowing up behind him and me coming in and just destroying every single one of them, throwing them over the top rope. And it was just, a, it was a lot of fun just to film. And it was kind of a rainy muggy day, which just, I think added to the whole thing. I think we had to stop filming for a while because it was raining, but then when we got back into it, you know, and it just added to the feel like it would have been, probably a little bit different it was still been cool but if it had just been a sunny happy day it probably wouldn't have had the same feel but the fact that it was muggy and cloudy and kind of funky that day made it just that much better love it uh as tony mentioned and i mean we all know like you work with jake the snake roberts which is pretty incredible and having jake around is is wonderful backstage but how Mm -hmm. was that originally pitched to you working with jake um you know actually since we're coming up on going back to austin texas um, I'd signed with the company and I hadn't debuted yet. And so there was ideas that were coming up and what was going to happen and this and that. And I actually drove down to Austin just because I wanted to obviously be around everybody, you know, new guy in the company and things like that. And actually try to get a chance to talk to everybody and see kind of what the idea was moving forward. And um, there were a few names that were thrown out there as far as possible um, managers. And, you know, I didn't even know that a manager was being considered for me. Um, And then when Jake's name was brought up, you know, I've known Jake for many years. I've seen him, unfortunately, in some of his worst times. But to see him as good as he is and has been this whole time is just awesome. Um, But just knowing his style, his ability to deliver, you know, I'd spent almost nine years in Japan. um, So and I've been in the wrestling world for 21 years coming up on July 5th. Um, you know, it wrestled in the United States and whatnot. But it, again, it'd been almost a decade since I'd been in the U.S. On, as far as a major wrestling scene had been concerned. And Jake the Snake Roberts is an icon business. And- He's the man. I mean, yeah. I, 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 I love chatting with him backstage. I know you do, too. Yeah. And uh, it's, uh, it's been quite a combination. We're talking with uh, Lance Archer. Uh, Lance, uh, we talked about uh, Austin. We were in Austin, Texas in December. Mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. how was that? Be, how was that being back home? Uh, I mean, just always being home is a fun, cool experience. You know, I've got right. a lot of family and friends in the state and around the world. Um, so, you know, being that we were the, the company was there December of 2019 or excuse me, uh, uh I'm losing track I guess of time with everything that's going on. Yeah. It's just, I guess it was December, 2019. Yeah. So December 2019 times, yeah. was yeah. Yeah. December 2019 was uh, was Dallas. And that was when I first came around and started okay. talking to people. And the whole gotcha. idea of me even being a part of the company was there. And then right. um, they were February of 2020 before everything shut down is when they came to Austin. And that's when I drove down there. OK, very cool. Is it uh, did you have an offer from New Japan at the time? I did. I did. So what an was. Actual, no, keep going. Um. Oh, no, I was just going to say, you know, the New Japan, uh, as far as Japanese wrestling is concerned, a lot of times the old school way of doing business, especially with the foreigners, the gaijin, was just a tour by tour thing. And that's how I'd actually been with the company for, again, nearly nine years was just I came in, I had a contract for the tour that I was on. And when that tour was over, it was done. And it wasn't until the most recent years that they actually started signing a lot of the foreigners to full time contracts. 
Um, and I'd never had one with a company because I've been there so long. I think they were just used to that was the style of business they'd done with me. Um, and then literally almost the exact same time that the All Elite uh, offer came in, the New Japan offer came in. So I had two on the table right at the same time. What was ultimately your decision for going with All Elite Wrestling instead of going with the what you already knew? Right. I mean, I think there were a lot of pros and cons and it took a bit for me to weigh all the goods and bads as far as making that decision. You know, a place I've been for nearly nine years, a lot of friends and people that had kind of become family over in Japan. Um, and then the opportunity that All Elite Wrestling was providing, All Elite Wrestling was changing the professional wrestling world. I think I don't even think to a degree I would have been receiving the offer from New Japan if AEW didn't exist. Um uh, and I'm not saying that they they didn't even know that AEW was offering me the deal. I'm just saying that AEW was changing the wrestling world completely uh, from how everybody was doing business. And so that's kind of where that came out with me. So the opportunity to come back home to tour the United States, you know, again, this was prior to anybody knowing what was going to happen in 2020. Um, you know, uh, the new challenges of coming back to the U.S. and being an AEW, a company that was growing and changing the world of professional wrestling, all these things were just too enticing and something that I absolutely wanted to take on. I wanted to bet on myself and, and being a part of AEW. And, of course, uh, you, you get signed. Uh, Tony Khan uh, knows everything about everybody in wrestling. I mean, he's not going to bring in Lance Archer unless right. he knows a lot about you. So um, right. how did that meeting go, with first meeting with Tony Khan? It was in catering in Dallas. That was the crazy part. Oh, okay. um, I literally, you know, I, I, I actually come to the Chicago. <laughs> I'd come to the Chicago show when uh, Chris Jericho was crowned the first champion. I was in right. Chicago working for uh, an independent company called Warrior Wrestling. And, you know, they had the um, uh, the autograph stuff that was going on and whatnot. And the pay-per-view was that weekend. So I came to the show and everybody was so gracious and cool to have me backstage. You know, I knew a lot of the guys and girls that were with the company already. Um, and so I was just hanging out and I'd seen Tony and whatnot, but we never even had the opportunity to have a conversation. And then when AEW came to Dallas um, in, in December of 2019, I went to the show again just to see my friends and, and talk and hang out and whatnot. And um, actually, I was in catering and, and Tony came right up to me and he was like, oh, hey, man, nice to meet you. I'm Tony. And I was like, oh, I, yes, sir. I'm Lance uh, Hoyt or Lance Archer. And um, he, we just kind of shot the shit for a little bit and we're talking this and that. And, you know, he kind of inquired about my contractual status with New Japan. And I kind of told him, you know, I was in the old style of business, because at that time, again, I didn't have a full contract with the company and his eyes kind of widened. And he was like, oh, really? Um, and then I had a, a conversation with Chris Jericho uh, that evening. I came by the hotel and hung out for a bit. And Chris pulled me aside and we had a good conversation about things. And then like <laughs> that Friday after you guys were in Dallas, um, I got an email from uh, QT. It was like, hey, man, can you come down to Corpus? We'd like to talk to you. And then um, so I went down to Corpus the next week and had a good conversation with Q and, and uh, uh, Cody. And then, you know, everything kind of fast tracked them right there. Damn. All works out. Yeah, uh, very much. So so this is, you know, the, our Texas dates when we were originally mm -hmm. touring in the before times. And then you ended up making your debut in Atlanta once the pandemic had started, I believe. My my wrestling debut, yes. Correct. My physical, my physical debut was in physical. Salt Lake City when the world shut down. The last right. show where we're sitting there in the backstage going, <laughs> uh, the NBA is done, guys. What the hell's going on? Right. Yeah, we were supposed to go to Rochester the next week uh, to a sold-out house. And, right. you know, I had flights booked and everything. And then all of a sudden, nope. Nope. Goodbye. Anyway, so <laughs> you, you make a wrestling debut. I think it was April 1st against uh, Marco Stunt, which is yeah. always incredible because that helps sell you <laughs> as this like giant monster, right? And I know Marco loves working with giant guys because it's just like right. it, it lends so well to his style. Uh, what was it like going from Salt Lake, knowing you were doing this crazy debut in front of this like rabid fan base to you're in an empty arena at the Nightmare Factory wrestling Marco <laughs> Stunt? Like how was how were your expectations changed? I mean, it, it, you could, you, yeah, like everybody, we were just rolling punches. It was like, all right, what's happening? Because, you know, professional wrestling was like one of the only live uh, sports or really live anything that continued on. And that night with Marco Stunt was live. You know, I was right. debuting live in an empty arena. And thank goodness we had the, our guys and girls that were gracious enough to surround the ring and make some noise and yell and scream and boo and things of that nature, which, it, you know, it that made such a huge difference entire through this entire pandemic and everything we've been doing 
is the guys and girls and the extras and whatnot that, you know, acted as our fan base, because just for a wrestler who's in the ring, that noise helps you uh, focus and, and do what you normally do. So, you know, and I was just excited. It was just fun. You know, like I said, Marco's, <laughs> he's a very durable young man to say the least. Um, you know, it was one of those <laughs> moments where I stepped up there and I tossed him from every corner that could possibly do and in every way I could and choke slammed as high as I could and choke slammed him from the apron onto the guys out in the past the barricades. And, you know, it was, it was kind of a full kind of fun, cool feeling to know that it went so well to the point where Marco said he was getting phone calls and texts from other guys who, who weren't there at the show and going, Hey man, are you okay? And he was like, he's like, yeah, I'm good, man. You know, I, I think the, the biggest injury he had from that was he had some rug burn on his shoulder because the, the uh, fake grass that was on the ground when he took the choke slam and hit the ground. So, you know, for me to be able to go out there and, and, and destroy him the way I destroyed him, but to ultimately, um, not to actually physically kill the man was a pretty cool thing. <laughs> First pay-per-view match for you, Lance, was against Cody for the TNT yeah. Championship at Double or Nothing. You had a, a yeah. phenomenal match uh, just recently against Miro at Double or Nothing. But mm -hmm. the match that, that I think really just was your best on TV for us, and I know you've mm -hmm. had many great matches that, that I haven't seen, was mm -hmm. the one with Ray Phoenix. Mm-hmm. Uh, talk about that match. That that match is going to resonate for a long, long time. Yeah, I mean, Ray's one of those guys that if you step in the ring with and have a bad match with, there's really something wrong with you, but it always takes two to tango. So I'd like right. to believe that I absolutely held my own. Um, and the right. dynamic, I, I think I always have some of my best matches with guys in that dynamic, whether you're talking about Marco Stunt, Ray Phoenix, um, from my past working with guys like AJ Styles or Will Ospreay, those are always some of my best matches because the dynamic of the guys that are the smaller and can do all the amazing cool things. And then my size and my ability to just toss you to the ceiling, I think always mix as well. So to be able to step in there with Ray Phoenix on a dynamite in the main event, which was a, a huge honor to be put in a singles main event on AW dynamite, right. you know, and at a time it was a, you know, it was a tape show at the time. Um, and the ratings after the fact came out were really good for it. Um, right. And it was just fun. It was just a lot of fun from beginning to end to be able to go out there. And I think we had some time added to the match, which is kind of unheard of it's sometimes unheard of. in our sport and our business, <laughs> you know, to have time added. A lot of times we have time. Yeah. A lot of times we have time taken away from us, but they go, Hey man, you got right. a couple extra minutes and just to keep going and rolling with it and being two professionals and, and never missing a beat. Um, I think it helped me. I think it helped me become uh, be seen in a different light by the fan base, by the wrestlers, by the office, by everybody that was a part of it. And, you know, I just I take every opportunity, especially those moments and those opportunities to try to prove myself time and time again. And to be able to do it with Ray was just a really cool moment. At the uh, Brody Celebration of Life, one of the things that you had done was uh, dress up in his old Luke Harper mm -hmm. gear with the tank top and the jeans. And mm -hmm. what was your decision for doing that? Um, uh, you know, the whole show, beyond emotional, I think, for everybody involved because of the situation. Um, you know, there was a whole different dynamite that was planned, not but like two days prior to that. Um, and then Tony decided, no, this was going to be a celebration of life for Brody Lee um, and to be included in that and to be a part of a match with the Dark Order guys. Um, I didn't plan on doing it until like two or three hours prior to the match actually happened. And a friend of mine messaged me and he said, hey, man, you should dress in his old Brody Lee gear with the tank top and then the bandanas and the jeans and stuff like that. And um, I was like, oh, man, that's an amazing idea. So I, I basically kind of went down the line and said, is this something that's OK to do? They, absolutely. I ran over to a Walmart and bought everything that I needed for it. Sandra, who's one of our gear ladies, she used to help dirty up his tank tops back in the day. And she's <laughs> like, do you want me to do you want me to do that for you? And I said, like, yes, absolutely. And yanked it off and gave it to her. And she went and mucked it up to try to make it as look i'll think as possible and i think the cool part of that whole story is that i, I once i had all the costume on um i'd walk by amanda probably two or three times but she was so focused i mean trying to be strong and she's been beyond strong in this whole situation you know and, and seeing brody jr and how happy he is just to be around everybody in the wrestling ring old negative one and just makes everybody smile i think he's probably gotten every single person through this the best way possible that anybody could even think of. But anyway, I, she, she, I walked by her a couple of times, but she never even paid attention to it. 
Um, and then after the match, she came to me and she said she broke down in tears in a great way because the first time that she realized what I was wearing and what I was doing was during the match. When I walked out in between the guys, you know, they kind of separated and let me walk out by myself. And uh, I was in the full costume. She's like, that was the first time I realized you were in it. And I told her, I was like, I walked by you a couple of times. You never paid attention. She's like, I just had my head down. I was just trying to stay focused and strong. Um, and she said it was an amazing thing. So that that moment, her telling me that it was special to her to see it when I walked out there made the whole moment worth it, you know, just to make her know that I made her happy, made her proud. Um, you know, and it's just, yeah, it, it brought me to tears. So great stuff, Lance. Don't, we're talking uh, to the murder. Don't we're tell talking to the mur I'm sorry. Go ahead. I was just saying, don't tell anybody that the murder hog monster cried. Uh, we wouldn't dare. <laughs> Secret we safe wouldn't. with us, brother. <laughs> yeah. Believe you me. But we are talking to the murder hog monster who actually, as we mentioned, made his debut in Japan and made more his fair share of young fans cry. And those stories are coming up as we continue on AEW <laughs> Unrestricted. This is AEW Unrestricted. Tony and Aubrey here with the Murder Hawk Monster and his adorable puppy. If you're watching the YouTube version, you can see how cute this dog is. What's your dog's name? Buster Boy. Buster Boy. What's up, Buster Boy? Uh, we'll have to do a separate section with Buster Boy. Anyway, we're talking with Lance. Uh, we had mentioned previously all of the time he spent in Japan. Uh, you had actually made your debut in Japan, I believe. As far as? Oh, wrestling? <laughs> no, no. Ah, gotcha. Oh, you didn't? No. All right. Talk to, where did you make your debut? Tell yeah. us that. As far as my entire wrestling career is concerned? Yeah. Yeah, sure. Oh, wow. Uh, just in Texas. Actually, like I said, July 5th will be 21 years. Um, I, I debuted uh, <laughs> at an independent show in Austin, Texas for a small company called the Southwest Wrestling Federation. Uh, wow. We were we were performing before a amateur football league that was debuting in Austin. It was 105 degrees outside. <sighs> the, the tape on the ropes was literally melting off. Um, we put water on the canvas a couple times and within minutes would be completely evaporated out. Um, yeah, that was my debut. Like I said, on November 5th, 21 years ago. Wow. How, how uh, removed was that from your uh, college football career? How many years? Uh, a, a few years. I mean, okay. I, I tried to play, you know, through my first four years of college and then I kind of got out of it. I was just working in nightclubs in downtown Austin um, the guy who owned the club knew a guy that had started a wrestling school um, in Austin, in North Austin. And um, I, I just started going there about once or twice a week. It was probably about a good 45 minute hour drive because I lived in a small town uh, where I was going to school called uh, San Marcos, Texas, home of Texas State University. Right. Um, and, I, and I would drive from San Marcos to North Austin um, about two to three times a week. And it was just me and one other guy kicking each other's ass and the guy who trained me his name was solo Fitala, just a, a, a an island an islander that just had learned to wrestle and kind of was on the independent scene so there was nothing specific or anyone specific that had kind of trained me or did anything like that um i didn't even really learn the psychology of wrestling until i got on the road with some of Shawn michaels kids because he had a school down in san antonio texas and uh, we started traveling the road together and they'd be like, well, what are you going to do in your match? And I'd be like, I'm going to kick, punch and hit some moves. And they'd be like, <laughs> they'd be like, yeah, that doesn't make any sense. What are you going to, what's the psychology behind your match? And I'm like, what the heck are you talking about? We're not in school anymore. I don't need any psychology lessons, you know? And they, they kind of started cluing me in on the, the art that is professional wrestling, you know, right. because they'd actually been taught well through Sean's school. <laughs> um, whereas, <laughs> Whereas, whereas me, it was just like, hey, man, don't drop me on my head. Cool. Oh, man, you dropped me on my head. Don't, don't do that again. All right. Cool. I'll try not to. <laughs> so you, you do uh, you do debut as the Murder Hawk Monster in Japan, right? That was your debut there? Well, I, I, I debuted with New Japan Pro Wrestling in 2011. Um, okay. I'd actually done a few independent wrestling shots, um, uh, a company called Makahan, and then it turned into Big Time Vader because Vader was involved. And that was like 2007 through 2009. Okay. Um, I actually wrestled Andrew Tess Martin um, in one of his last matches ever. I was the last American he ever wrestled before his untimely passing. Um, and that was early 2009. I did a, a short tour with All Japan Wrestling in early 2009. Um, you know, and then I'm, that's when I did my uh, stint with the company up north. 
Um, and then I debuted with uh, New Japan in June of 2011. And I was actually using a different moniker. It was called I was called the American Psycho back then. Oh. Um, yeah, and I didn't I, I didn't debut the Murder Hot Monster until July of 2019 um, when I started uh, New Japan Pro Wrestling did their big event. Event, the G1 Climax in Dallas, Texas at the American Airlines Center. Um, and that I wrestled Will Ospreay in the very first G1 match to ever occur off of Japanese soil. Um, and then I changed my look. I changed my kind of the mentality, the way I approached the ring, everything about it. And the, the name kind of was dawned off the hairstyle and everything because it was kind of a mohawk and it was a little bit different than it is now. Um, and I just called it the murder hawk. And then I just became the murder hawk monster. Uh, I want to know, are you an expert braider? Am I an expert? No, no. I have an amazing girl here in Dallas that she takes care of me. In fact, I'll be going to see her on Monday to get it redone. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, yeah. I noticed also that you've like changed the color of your braid <laughs> from time to time. I think currently it's black. When you first debuted with us, it was kind yeah. of red. You experimented with a little green here and there. Uh, what's your philosophy for right. how your hair changes with your character? Yeah, I mean, I obviously I've had a lot of red in my gear. And so I've just kind of held, kept that to match it. You know, when I uh, had my match with Moxley, I actually bleached out the my real hair and put more blonde in it and the blonde and red. Um, when I was doing the green, it's because I got some new gear that was green. So I kind of wanted to match that. Right now, currently with the black, it's just, you know, after the loss to Miro uh, at the pay-per-view, I wanted the mentality to completely change and be a little more straightforward, a little more dark, a little more ready just to kick some ass and get the hell out of there. You know, I'm not not playing around. I'm just going in. I'm doing my job and I'm leaving. I'm not there to showboat. I'm not there to the glad hand. I'm just there to kick your ass, put your teeth through your face and then leave. I absolutely love that. Mentality. It's uh. I, anytime I go to like raise your hand, you're already just peacing out. <laughs> I'm like, oh, oh God, he's he's done. Bye, Lance. I actually, I actually got uh, one of our crew guys came to me uh, the other day and said, "Hey, man, is, is anybody from production talk to you?" And I'm like, "Oh, what do I do now?" Um, and they're like, "Oh, well, you know, like when you're leaving so fast, they don't know whether you're going to get a you know an out shot or what, and they're they're scrambling to get a camera somewhere to follow you." And I'm like, "Nope, they can try to follow me if they want, but I'm out of there." <laughs> The, uh, the braids, uh, for some reason, Lance, you and I have been on the same flight out of Jacksonville for, Jacksonville for quite a while. The uh -huh. braids are really a hit at the airport. I can tell you that. They are. <laughs> I'll tell you, when they're not in, it's it's hilarious. Like, you sometimes I forget. Because, again, I was in Japan for so long. Um, in, in Japan, obviously, there was a, a name people recognized me and things like that in Japan because of New Japan Pro Wrestling. Uh, but in the States, because I've been gone for so long, I kind of other than just being a big dude and people going, well, who are you and what do you do? I kind of lived in obscurity. Um, right. And I didn't realize the the outreach that AEW had as far as the wrestling fan base is concerned and everything until I. I was with the company and debuting and, and on TV consistently because when the braid is in, I constantly, especially because we've been wearing masks for so long, you know, people can't really see your face. The braid is so recognizable sometimes that people will just see it and they'll go, hey, wait a second, are you? And then, you know, we'll have that conversation and whatnot. But if I don't have the braid in, I mean, I've had interactions with people wearing AEW masks, AEW t-shirts, not have the braid in and then people not realizing who they're talking to until after the fact. Oh my and God. it's just because I didn't have the braid in. <laughs> we touched on this a little bit uh, before the break, but you mm -hmm. legit made kids cry during your entrance oh. in Japan. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, like, what did you do to make children cry? <laughs> like, I'm, I'm legit curious. <laughs> Um, <laughs> uh, I just tried to scare the absolute shit out of them uh, is what I did. Um, yeah, it, it, I think that's the fun thing about the Japanese culture. So a uh, little backstory, they have a, 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 a kind of folklore. It's called Namahage and Namahage basically is like a, it's a demon or a spirit that comes and it scares children and the, the parents and the families want Namahage children so that then they realize that they can be scared and they're going to be okay and then it helps them to grow into stronger adults so I kind of had but from the Japanese people they were kind of calling me the Namahage because I was scaring these kids and you if you've seen any of the videos or the pictures the kids are absolutely terrified they're crying bawling screaming and yelling because they're thinking they're going to die at that moment and their dad or whoever is holding them has the 
biggest smile on their face or is laughing uncontrollably because they absolutely love the moment that happens. I mean, you know, the guys like Stan Hansen, who used to come to the crowd and legitimately hit people with a cowbell. Um, mm-hmm. That's 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 very tame in comparison. <laughs> so, yeah. Uh, but yeah, the families and the fathers, you'll see pictures that I posted or videos I posted and they just they love it. But the kid obviously is scared to death, which yeah. I love. I used to see the the shots of Tiger Jeet Singh come through the crowd mm-hmm. with his whip mm-hmm. hitting people mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. people would scatter. And, and I was told you probably know this, that for fans to be hit. For some of the Japanese fans, it was kind of like an honor, right? Am I wrong? Yeah. No, yeah. you're right. Yeah. Well, prior, I mean, I, I think during the whole, you know, scaring children, I also used to, prior to the pandemic, things like that, I used to come through the crowd with probably six to seven bottles of water in my jeans. Um, and I would empty them, empty them out, either spitting the water into the air or just throwing the water as much as I could at the people. And my entrance was never down the ramp to the ring. It was out of the tunnel, straight into the audience and try to empty every single one of these bottles on the audience to the point where I'd come around corners and people would be holding their children up. Like, please bless my child with your water. <laughs> um, and pe- people, you know, people literally made signs in English and it would say like water, water here, things like that. Yeah. You know, and <laughs> it, was, it was actually a really cool thing. And then the company asked me to stop doing it randomly because supposedly um, I messed up some girl's uh, Louis Vuitton bag and they had to pay for it. So they're like, ah, you have to stop doing that. I went, hmm, okay. <laughs> well, if you're going to a wrestling show, like that's, that's on you. That, yeah. That was, that was my argument, but it didn't work. So yeah. <laughs> it's one of those, like, like if you go to an amusement park and you're sitting in the front row of like one of those whale shows, like you're going to get wet. Like if you're yeah. going to a wrestling show and the talent's there, like right. be mindful. You probably don't want to bring your super expensive purse with you, but you know, I digress. Right. <laughs> uh, so there was actually a moment where you you wrestled under a mask, I think at PCW. Oh wow! <laughs> what was so yeah. so? You're you have a very like distinct look. I'm curious, what was mm-hmm. the reasoning for switching to a mask? Um, I mean, I, I put on the mask, and I, I think I wore like a long sleeve shirt and everything. And I I was doing a character named Shadow at the time uh, for PCW. PCW was, you know, talking about my debut and things like that, PCW was probably the company that helped me the most um, and and helping prepare me for big time wrestling because it was a small independent company in Dallas, Texas that ran for several years. We had TV on local uh, affiliate called um, UPN 21 or something like that. Uh, But we had a, we had a small arena that had four video screens. Every, you know, main wrestler had their own entrance video and song, um, you know, we, again, we filmed for TV. So we had hard cameras, we had floor cameras, we filmed backstage segments. Um, so it, I think it really helped prepare anybody that went on, you know, when I started working with TNA back in its early days and then so on and so forth is learning how to work for cameras and not just a live audience, which is such a different thing. Um, so as far as shadow was concerned, I think I'd been there for some time. Um, and it was just one of those, I need to do something different. And this was something I'd kind of wanted to try to do. I'd been off TV for some time as far as they were concerned. Um, and so it was just something I, I, I wanted to try to do. So I had a friend of mine whose wife could make masks. She made me a mask and it was like a black mask and it had like a red cross across the front with mesh so I could actually see through it. And then I wore like a long sleeve shirt. It was not a gimmick that lasted very long because like, you said the distinct look i think everybody knew because i didn't change the name or anything i was still shadow i was just trying to give people kind of a different version of shadow at the time so uh, it was fun for the quick moment that it existed but it didn't exist long all right you ask and now lance archer will answer fan questions are coming up next on aew unrestricted You're listening to AEW Unrestricted, official podcast of all elite wrestling. We've got Aubrey and Tony here bringing your fan questions to Lance. There's oh. some really good ones here. I'm a legit a couple that I'm, I have myself. So uh, <laughs> good job in our fan base for uh, covering my checks. Uh, first one we have from Leanne Wakeland on Twitter. If you could build your own faction, who would you have in it? You can choose any wrestler from any promotion that you've worked in. Oh, that's an interesting one for sure. Um, you know, one I've actually been thinking about recently, and I think it would be a fun fit is a couple of our guys, uh, Bear Country. Oh. I think it'd be kind of, 
I think it'd be a fun, interesting. You have you have Bear Country, you have the Murder Hawk Monster, and Jake the Snake Roberts. Talk about the Animal Kingdom, the Monster Militia, whatever you want to call us. Uh, <laughs> a, a large group of just beastly dudes going out there and whooping some ass. I, I think it'd be kind of a fun faction for those guys. And then, I mean, you could throw in like somebody like Abaddon to kind of crawl in underneath us as we're standing on the stage and <laughs> things like that. I mean, I, I think the visual of that just by itself would be a, a fun thing for the all elite wrestling fan base. So, you know, that's one I've kind of thought about and pitched around. I actually joked about it uh, recently on Twitter because uh, bear, or, uh, Ethan Page, you know, the way he took advantage of uh, Baby Bear, Bear Bronson, was to kind of give him a low blow and then stack him up and give him the the ego's edge there. Um, and I, he kind of did the same thing to me at the uh, Revolution pay-per-view. I think that's the only way he can get us big dudes up is to low blow us and to carry us out for his finish there. Um, so since he did that, I told Big Bear, I was like, hey, man, until Big Bear comes back, you know, if you need a partner, hit me up and we'll go take out those uh, men of the what, men of the hour, men of the day. Men of the year. <laughs> men of the year. Oh, OK, they, they expanded upon it. So, you know, I don't know. I, I, I'll call them the men of the hour because once we're done with them, that hour's out. Boom. There you go. <laughs> this next question comes from Iana. I guess that's how you pronounce it, Liana, on Twitter. Mm -hmm. As a fellow small town Texan, mm -hmm. what's it like for you to hear your hometown of Hearn mentioned during your entrance? Um, I, that's a good question, too. I, I think it's really special because I've been mentioned from Dallas, Texas, a lot of my time in the business, whether it was uh, TNA, uh, WWE or Japan, it was always Dallas, Texas. Um, and then when, you know, we were talking about it as far as, you know, where do you want to be built from at AW? I was like, I'd really like it to be a Hearn, Texas, because it's something that you're not going to hear very often. You'll hear Dallas, Texas all the time from different wrestlers. And it's kind of just a general area of, of where you're at, but Hearn, Texas is very specific. Um, and for anybody that's asking Hearn, Texas is a small town. I think about 5,000 people total. It's near Bryan College Station, Texas, which is the home of the Texas A&M Aggies. So right. it's about 20 minutes from there. Again, very small town. It's kind of called the, the crossroads of Texas because the two major uh, railways cross through Hearn, Texas. And um, so, I mean, that's that's our claim to fame. Myself, uh, John Randall, who's a Hall of Famer in the NFL from the uh, uh, Minnesota Vikings. We're, I think I guess we're the two biggest names to kind of come out of Hearn, Texas. Biggest names, quite literally and figuratively. <laughs> We got a question from Wade Odinson on Twitter. You've been very open about your faith, but there's no mm -hmm. aspects of it in your character. Was it an active mm -hmm. choice to keep the wall between these pieces of yourself? Um, I, I think it wasn't an active choice, but it's just kind of my reality. You know, I mean, I think there's a very huge duality to the personality. There's the, the real man, Lance Hoyt. Um, and then there's the murder hog monster, Lance Archer. And, you know, it's not the point of trying to keep them separate. I just think the idea behind the murder hog monster and the way I present myself and the things that I do in the ring are very different than my um, actual faith. And as far as my faith is concerned, it's a very personal thing. I mean, I promote it. I'm not ashamed of it. I'm not shy about it, but I definitely don't try to push it upon anyone. If anyone asks me about it, I'm absolutely willing to talk to them about, you know, how I feel and my faith and everything like that. But I don't go around you know, because I could so easily be judged because I'm absolutely not a perfect person by any means necessary. Um, but I don't go around judging anyone because I'm no better than anyone else. And that's why I believe in Christ as my savior, because I need a savior. And that's just how I feel and believe. But as far as the separation of personality and character, I, I think it's never just been an active thing. It's just something that has existed. You know, there's a difference between the Murderhawk monster, Lance Archer and the real man. Lance Boyd. All right. Very, very, very well said. Wesley Willis on Twitter wants to know, now that you are all back on the road, are mm -hmm. there any foods from restaurants that Lance Archer is looking forward to eating? <laughs> um, you know, I think that's the fun part. And one of the reasons, you know, as far as traveling in the U.S. was concerned, because, you know, you go everywhere in different places, whether in Chicago for deep dish pizza or up in New York. And I'm going to mention pizza a lot. I guess New York style pizza and wherever you go, there's going to be all kinds of different foods that people, you know, go to Philadelphia and the, the uh, sandwiches and things like that. You know, it's, it's fun to go and experience the different cultures around the country, uh, something that I haven't really had a chance to do in, in such a long time. You know, I, I know Jacksonville in and out now. Uh, because of our time there. So, so it's, 
<laughs> so it's a fun idea to, to be able to go to the different areas and experience the different foods. As far as anything very specific, I don't know. I'm, I'd like to hear people's opinions and thoughts of things that I can add peanut butter to and, and, and try it. Yeah. Okay. So question uh, from Aubrey Edwards on Twitter. How did the tuna <laughs> and peanut butter thing start? <laughs> um, so it, it was one of those things like I, I actually saw it on TV. Um, I can't remember the dang show's name. Um, but it was one of the, the the traveling shows on like Discovery. The, he's a bigger bald dude and he would go anywhere and everywhere in the world and he would try uh, foods from every corner of the world and so he just happened to be in okinawa japan and these old japanese ladies i mean they were probably in their 90s easy and they're just cruising around the kitchen like they're in their 50s i don't know um and you know they're preparing their food and they're not they're basically pushing him out of the way because he's kind of in the way they're talking to him the entire (laughs) time in japanese which he can't understand a word they're saying and all of a sudden they kind of have this little dish and it's peanut butter and he sees that they're mixing it up and he's like what are they doing and they're like you know this is kind of a traditional okinawan old school thing and it's kind of an appetizer and these old japanese lady they mixed it up and they gave him a bite and he took a bite and he's like that's not that bad um and so i think i was home one night and it was just basically like it's one of those nights where you don't really have anything to eat you don't want to eat bad you don't want to order something or go get some fast food and, and feel bad about what you just ate i'm not prepared to cook up a nice good you know grilled chicken meal or steak meal or anything like that so i had tuna i had peanut butter and i'm like i'll i like tuna to some degree i love peanut butter let me mix this up and try it. And so I did. And it wasn't that bad. And I specifically say you have to use sweet and spicy peanut or sweet and spicy tuna. Um, I've tried lemon pepper and a couple others and it's okay. But the sweet and spicy tuna mixed with just a little dollop of peanut butter, I think is perfect. Um, And just to point out, I think pretty much everybody that has tried it, eventually tried it, even though they say it sounds disgusting, has eaten it and then said, you know what? That wasn't that bad. Oh my god <laughs> so you should try it Aubrey. i mm. don't eat animals otherwise oh that's right that's oh, right okay. i forgot i'm sorry yeah All so right. i mean even if i did eat animals i wouldn't try it so <laughs> you're uh not Tony, that bad isn't really it. isn't really a I'll, sell for it i'll try it i really will <laughs> we're gonna have to film uh, that and put it out there <laughs> yeah L- lisa lockhart on twitter how how much have you enjoyed being a part of aew and what match that you've been in we've talked about some of your matches What's right. been your absolute favorite one in AEW to be in? Man, that's that's like when people try to ask me what's my favorite match of my entire career. Um, the opportunities that AEW has provided me has been above and beyond, I think, really anything that I could have expected. Um, to Even though I haven't been successful, to be in three title matches within a year has been beyond special. To be in the initial TNT Championship match with Cody, to, to fight on the anniversary show with Moxley for the AEW Championship, to just most recently fight against Miro on Double or Nothing in front of our first sold-out crowd was right. amazing. I mean, all these moments are amazing, but I, I do like you have to go back to the Ray Phoenix moment because I think it was... And, you know, a a little backstory on that, too. That match wasn't even supposed to happen the way it was happening. Um, I got a phone call around two o'clock in the morning uh, from Tony himself going, hey, you're going to wrestle Phoenix tomorrow in a singles match. And initially it was supposed to be a tag match. uh, Phoenix and I, I think, against Butcher and Blade, I believe, because there was a little bit of a storyline going on there. But then they decided to make it a a qualifying match to get into the Revolution pay-per-view. Um, and so that was kind of a cool, neat experience to kind of, like I said, be laying in bed, not expecting a phone call like that to get it. And the next day be doing the match and for it to turn out as amazing as it did. Uh, I, I think that has to be right now, probably my most special match in AEW. But I said, because of all the different opportunities that I had, all the different title matches that I've had, the pay-per-view this, that I've been a part of, um, all of them are really cool and special. But I think that's the number one for me. And a fantastic match. So it's great to have that be one that's uh that's close to your heart. More yeah. peanut butter questions. Uh, okay. <laughs> Adequate at best on Twitter says, I'm also a fan of Jif peanut butter. What's the weirdest thing you've put on peanut butter? The suggestion here is spicy Doritos. <laughs> um, man, you know, I've, I've put peanut butter on pizza. I put peanut butter on some hot dogs more recently. Um, you know, I've been challenged to put peanut butter on, uh, uh, quite a few things that I haven't had an opportunity to do. So 
Um, to me, nothing is really weird. I, I like peanut butter so much that I think anything that I like food wise, if I put peanut butter on it, it just adds to it. So nothing makes it weird for me. Uh, so, I mean, I'll put peanut butter on steak. I'll put peanut butter on hamburger. I'll put peanut butter on pizza. I'll put peanut butter, like I said, on hot dogs. Uh, just you name it. I'll probably put peanut butter on it. <laughs> wow. Peanut butter on a hamburger sounds very intriguing. Very intriguing. <laughs> it is. It's actually really good. Yeah, I bet. Man. I believe it. I believe it. All right. Uh, Rip on Twitter. The murder hawk. This is a, this is a very good question. Uh, All right. The Murderhawk Monsters offense is a beautiful, violent mixture of legendary big men in wrestling. Mm-hmm. How about that? That's, right. That's a good description. Who would you like to tag with legendary against some of the legendary teams like the Steiner Brothers or the Hart mm-hmm. Foundation? Who would be your tag team partner? Um, you know, I think my style has really grown from the idea of Stan Hansen. So it's for, for Stan Hansen in his heyday, uh, not only would I love to have a match against Stan Hansen, because I think we'd beat the absolute shit out of each other and it'd be a lot of fun for everybody to watch. I think right. him and I blazing through a crowd, him with his cowbell, me scaring children, stepping in a ring with any team, I think would be a lot of fun, whether it be against the Steiner brothers or or any legendary legendary team that you can think of. Um, I, I think it'd be fun for uh, old Stan Hansen in his heyday and the Murderhawk yeah. monster to step in the ring and fight the young bucks of today. I think that'd be yeah. such a cool match. Ooh, that'd be great. I agree. <laughs> have you have you met Stan? Yes, I met him a few times. You know, they would bring him to to Japan and uh, him and right. he he him and he ah, can't even speak right now. He his son and I myself sat down to breakfast one day, and that was a really cool experience to be able to sit down and kind of talk wrestling, time talk to his son and, and whatnot. He actually lives in Waco, Texas, um, which is about you know an uh, hour and a half, two hours from me, less yeah. than that, really. One of the great guys, man. One of the legends. Yeah. You're right. I'm yeah. with you, buddy. Stan Hansen. All right. Uh, I, one uh, quick question. This is uh, going to come from me. We haven't touched on it, but you played college football. You were a quarterback. Did you ever really want – was that a, a career choice for you to move to – in other words, did you want to be a professional football quarterback? Yes, I did. I think um, that was my initial dream was to play okay. football and play it in the NFL. You know, I would when I was in you know high school before I even started my senior year in high school. Um, I remember I had a, a tire and I would drag it from my mom's house, which our football field was, you know, it was a, a couple hundred yards away. It wasn't even that far from my mom's house. And there would always be like one light that would shine down on one of the goalposts uh, on the field. And like I said, it was just kind of maybe a security light, you know, for anybody that was out there at night, maybe walking the track or whatever. And I would drag this tire out there and I had a rope on it and I would hang it over the end of the goalpost and I would take a bag full of balls and I would just drop back and throw passes from every placement I could think of to try to uh, improve my accuracy. And, um, I started my senior year in high school and then I went on to try to play at Howard Payne University my first two years in college. And then I transferred over to Texas State. Uh, I tried to play one year there. It didn't work out. Um, You know, I've become a professional wrestling fan at that point. You know, we had our Monday night get togethers where we would sit and have WCW and WWF on the screens, you know, or recording one on an old VHS tape and watching the other one. You know, this is before DVR, before anything like that. So, you know, you still had to have your old VHS tapes. And, um, you know, I'd become a fan of professional wrestling, but again, pro football was my dream. And it wasn't until I got out of football when I realized, you know, things weren't going to happen the way I practiced for and pushed for and whatnot, um, that professional wrestling kind of came into the picture. You know, I still wanted to do something that was athletic and I enjoyed the acrobat acrobatics and the athleticism and the action and everything that was involved in professional wrestling. And then when I had that opportunity to get into it, um, actually fun story about when I first did my very first tryout for professional wrestling, because like everybody, you don't really understand the business and how physical it actually is. You see what you see on TV and you see the action and you see the theatrics that go into it. Um, And if you don't know, you just don't know. And I went in for my first tryout and, um, you know, they had me running the ropes. They had me taking bumps. They had me dropping elbows. They had me doing all these basic things, probably not even shouldn't have been doing them at the time, you know, for my very first day ever stepping in the ring. And I remember I left there and the next day I was in so much pain. Uh, I didn't want to go back. And actually the guy who owned the school called me and was like, Hey man, so you ready to come start training? And I was like, Oh man, 
I don't think I can afford it. You know, I'm just a poor college kid, you know, at <laughs> Shawn Michaels school at the time was like 1300 bucks a month. And so I'm thinking that's what this guy's going to try to charge me. And I was like, I can't afford it. I was like, I can't, you know, I don't have the money. So that was going to be my out. I can't pay for it. He goes, wait a second. He goes, how much can you pay? And I said, mm, 200 bucks a month. And he goes, sold, come on. So now I was backed into a corner. It was like, either I pay this and go, or now I have to come up with a new excuse. And luckily I didn't come up with a new excuse. I, my mom was cool enough to help me pay that 200 bucks a month. And the rest is history. Very well, cool. Works out Great in your favor story. in the long term. Yeah. yeah, very much. Very cool story. All right, Lance. Thanks a lot, man. Thank you for having me on guys. Yeah, no problem. You can uh, follow uh, Lance on Instagram at Lance underscore Hoyt and on Twitter at Lance Hoyt. You can listen to AEW Unrestricted Podcast for free wherever you get your podcasts. New episodes every Thursday. Please leave us a rating, review, subscribe, and watch us on YouTube every Monday morning. Yeah, you can search AEW Unrestricted to get the YouTube version, by the way, on YouTube. And don't forget Elevation Monday nights, AEW Dark on Tuesday. Those are only on YouTube. But then on Wednesdays, we've got... AEW Dynamite. Yeah. Right back, back live every Wednesday, 8 o'clock Eastern, 7 Central. And coming up soon in the month of August will be Rampage as well. Yeah. All right. Thanks again, Lance, for being with us. And my name is Tony Schiavone. My name's Aubrey Edwards. Thanks, everybody. Stay safe.